Welcome to this broadcast service to all the Church of Scotland congregations in this area. Grantley, Logie Raid, Strathtay, Aberfeldy, Dullin Weem, and Fortingall, Glen Lyon, Kenmore and Lors. Welcome too to any visitors who are joining us. Although we're all in separate places, we are still a gathered community of God's people, worshipping together as we join in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're here in the porch of Fortingall Church. In case you're wondering why I'm here, this is one of the specific reasons allowed by the government and the Church of Scotland for being in a church at this time, provided only two people are involved. I'm grateful to Jamie Pringle for being here at a safe distance to handle the technicalities. I know you're all missing your own churches. I hope that in some way you will feel that you're here with us. This seems in some ways an appropriate place to be at a time like this, when we're facing an unexpected yet historic challenge. This place gives us some perspective, not just because of the 4,000 year old yew tree just outside the church here. Actually, it's maybe only 2,000 years old, but that's still pretty old. History and archeology span strongly suggest that there has been a Christian presence here from the seventh century, originally established by monks from Iona. And there was a monastery here until the 10th century before the larger center at Dull took over. There's been a parish church in this place at least from the 12th century. How much has changed in the world in that time? Yet Christian worship has continued here through all of it. Technology is today enabling us to do what our forebears have done for one and a half millennia. We would normally begin our services with a hymn or a song, but instead of inflicting my singing on you, I'm going to read a hymn of praise, which I think speaks very relevantly into our troubled times. If you've got a hymn book at home and like to look it up and follow it, you'll find it at 160 in CH4 or 560 in Mission Praise. It's Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. And while you're looking it up, we're going to move into the church and continue the service from there. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. To his feet thy tribute bring, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like thee his praise should sing? Praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him. Praise the everlasting King. Praise him for his grace and favor to our fathers in distress. Praise him still the same forever, slow to chide and swift to bless. Praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him. Glorious in his faithfulness. Father-like he tends and spares us. Well our feeble frame he knows. In his hands he gently bears us rescues us from all our foes. Praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, widely as his mercy flows. Frail as summer's flower we flourish, blows the wind and it is gone. But while mortals rise and perish, God endures unchanging on. Praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him. Praise the High Eternal One. Angels, help us to adore Him. Ye behold Him face to face. Sun and moon bow down before Him, dwellers all in time and space. Praise Him, praise Him. Praise Him, praise Him. Praise with us, the God of grace. Let us join together now in our prayers. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we praise you as King of heaven, high eternal one, who made all things, to whom alone our worship is due. We thank you for the eternal truths of that hymn, that you are unchanging, faithful in all your promises, 
the God who was trusted by those who have gone before us and whom we can trust now. Lord God, we confess before you now our many failings and failures, our lack of trust in you, our lack of love for others, our selfishness and pride, the blind eye we sometimes turn towards injustice, our silence when we need to speak out. It astonishes us that although you know us completely, yet you love us with a true Father's heart. In Jesus, you have revealed just how much you would do to win us back to you. Through the work of Jesus, we, who are undeserving of your grace, are ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. So we praise you, joining as we do with our brothers and sisters in Christ in this area, in this country, throughout this world, with all creation, and even with the angels round your throne in heaven, who praise with us the God of grace. And now I'll say the word of the Lord's Prayer, and please join in if you wish. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever. Amen. This is Palm Sunday when we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It is also known as Passion Sunday, the start of Holy Week, when we think about what is to follow in these next few days, leading up to another procession to the cross at Calvary. I want to talk this morning about those two processions where we are observers, but I'm also going to talk about a third procession, in which we are participants. First reading is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, and reading from verse 1. Matthew 21, from verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The key question which this procession raised was, What kind of Messiah are you waiting for? That was the question that Jesus posed with his dramatic entry to Jerusalem. The crowd who welcomed him and followed him into the city were largely those who had come up for the festival, people who had listened to his teaching, who had seen evidence of his miracles, some who had been there when Lazarus was brought out of his tomb. What did they want? A miracle worker who could heal them, sort out all their problems, give them peace and prosperity? Maybe. 
There were others who saw Jesus as a rebel leader, a populist who had the charisma to inspire the people to rise up against the Roman occupiers and drive them out of the land. Effectively, a reincarnation of David, their great warrior king on the past. Yes, he was indeed their king. Yes, they were absolutely right to praise him. But what kind of Messiah? Jesus answered that five days later, as another procession made its slow and painful way out of the city. The sad procession to the place of the skull, Golgotha, where he was fastened by nails to a wooden cross. A Messiah, a saviour who demonstrated total humility and self-sacrifice as God in love took upon himself all the consequence of humanity's separation from our Creator. The ultimate in love from a Father who does not force us as he could, but seeks to win us back through grace, his free gift of love. We observe that first procession into the city and would wish to join the crowd, waving our palm branches and praising our coming King. We observe that second procession out of the city through tears in our eyes as we think that it is our sin that caused his pain, our disobedience which put him on the cross. What of that third procession? We find it in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 2, and reading from verse 12. 2 Corinthians 2, from verse 12. And Paul writes, Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind, because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. I had thought several days ago of, of including this passage in the sermon, but it was only when I read it again a couple of days later that I realized just how relevant it is for today. That particular relevance comes not so much from the wonderful statement of thanksgiving, but from the bit of travelogue that precedes it, the bit we might skip over to get to the good bit. What Paul is telling us is that when he came to Troas, he was able to preach and do good work, but he couldn't settle there. That's because he was anxious about his friend and colleague, Titus. It was partly a personal concern for Titus. These were dangerous times. Travel itself had many risks, and being a Christian brought added threats. Paul desperately wanted to know that Titus was safe and well. But there was another concern for the congregation in Corinth that Titus had gone to see. There had been some real difficulties there, and Paul had written to them in severe terms to try to correct them, both in their theology and their behavior. He was anxious to know whether they had seen the error of their ways or had turned away from their faith, the faith he had so carefully instilled in them. Paul doesn't immediately tell us how it all worked out, not this point in the letter. After all, he was writing to the Corinthians, who already knew, not to us. But he's obviously thinking about the result, and he rejoices. In chapter 7, we found out why. Not only did he later meet up with Titus and found him to be safe and well, but he also heard from Titus the great news that the Corinthians had indeed repented, and their fellowship was restored. These are anxious times for all of us. Are we not all anxious in varying degrees as we experience something that none of us have lived through before? 
And I say that as someone who did miss a few weeks of school during the typhoid epidemic in Aberdeen in 1964, when parts of the city were in lockdown. You can look it up, but don't look in the Wikipedia because it's not very accurate. But that was limited to one city. What we're experiencing now is orders of magnitude more serious. It would be quite wrong of me to say that everything will work out fine and tell you not to worry. None of us knows for sure how or when this will all end or what consequences it will have for our own lives or the society in which we live. Even worse for me would be to tell you that anxiety is in some way a weakness in your faith. Paul, as we've just seen, was anxious, so much so that his mind could not rest. It is true that there are things we should try not to be anxious about. Jesus tells us to trust God for our daily necessities. So we should be the last people to panic by. He also says that we shouldn't be overly concerned about ourselves. God is with us, which doesn't mean we can't suffer. In fact, Jesus tells us that we will. We will also have to die, and that can't be put off forever. But still, God does not let us go. We have to trust him with that, even when it appears that we are abandoned, because we never are. But caring about others, being anxious for them, that's never wrong. Caring about the church, our own fellowship and others, that's never wrong. But Jesus does not want us to be overwhelmed by that care, that anxiety. He tells us to bring those burdens to him in prayer. In fact, it is that care, that anxiety, which drives us to prayer. That's what we see Paul doing here. He reminds himself how it all turned out for Titus and the Christians in Corinth. He would have recalled other instances of great danger, when in the world's eyes he may have looked defeated, but when in fact he knew that through it all, God's kingdom continued to advance, as it still does today. William Barclay has a graphic description of what must have been in Paul's mind when he wrote this passage. The scene is of a triumph a victory procession into Rome, which was awarded by the Senate only to the most successful of their generals. To qualify, the general must have waged a campaign with great battles fought and won, which resulted in a significant increase in territory, with the region pacified and wealth and leaders captured. This happened so rarely that you might see only one of these triumphs in a lifetime. First came the senators and other senior officials. Then came the trumpeters, followed by the spoils of war, treasures looted from the enemy, and pictures of the conquered land, and models of citadels overthrown, and so on. Then came the captives, kings, rulers, generals, senior officials, in chains on their way to prison and most likely execution. Then came minor officials and musicians. Then the priests swinging their censers of incense. Then a large white bull for sacrifice. Now the crowds would see the general himself standing in a chariot drawn by four horses, holding an ivory scepter with an eagle on the top, the symbol of Rome, and the crown of Jupiter held over his head by a slave. He was followed by members of his family Finally, there came the soldiers of his army, rank upon rank, cheering for their victory. Lining the streets with the citizens, cheering everything and throwing garlands on the soldiers. It must have been an amazing, unforgettable sight. That's what was on Paul's mind. He'd maybe never seen one of these for himself, but he would certainly have heard about them. So now we can see what he was imagining. The aroma of incense would have lingered in the air as the troops marched through, a constant reminder of their triumph and the spoils which that would bring them. As Victorian Roman soldiers, they were made for life. But also, the prisoners out in front would have had a whiff every so often of that incense too, as it blew forwards from the priests. But to them, 
it meant defeat and death. Out of his anxiety for people who were precious to him, Paul was able to see the victory won by Christ, the triumphal procession he had been invited to to share in, undeserving though he knew himself to be, the triumphal procession we are all asked to join, undeserving as we are. When we join it, we too can carry the aroma of Christ into wherever he calls us to be. In these times, it might be on the phone or a video call to family and friends. It might be in helping neighbors and strangers where and when we can. It might also mean graciously receiving the kindness and generosity of others. It also means, for some, taking the aroma of Christ into the hospitals and care homes as workers or patients. These are going to feel like a lonely place for some, but we are assured that Jesus is already there before us. Maybe as you thought about that procession that Paul describes, you were worried that you might be in that group of prisoners out front, held there by the chains of whatever has captured your life, whatever controls you, that you're not a follower of Jesus, but someone who is captive to other gods. The good news for you is that the triumphant general in this procession is actually nothing like those Roman generals. Instead, he is full of love and compassion. He doesn't want to throw you into a prison. Instead, he is able to, able and willing to pluck you out of that sad place and put you in the ranks of his followers. He's just waiting for you to ask him. And then you can be with those who shout of his triumph, who spread the sweet fragrance of life, the fragrance that comes from knowing him.
Now we come to a time of prayer again. Our prayers of intercession are adapted from a prayer written some three weeks ago by the moderator, the Right Reverend Colin Sinclair. I used that the last time the congregation met here in Fortingal Church. Things have moved on, and some of our concerns today are a bit different, but a lot of what Colin wrote is still very relevant. Let us pray. Lord God, in our hour of need, we turn again to you, for we have nowhere else to turn. We put our faith in you because you have proved your faithfulness time and again. We reaffirm our love for you because you have never let us go. We thank you that you are not distant from us, but have drawn near in your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. He has shared our life, tasted our death and defeated it. He understands our worries and our fears. Help us to respond as your children now. We pray about this pandemic which has spread across our world. We remember all who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who are seriously ill. We are saddened at the added distress for relatives and friends who are unable to visit, and for those who feel isolated from their families in their hour of greatest need. May they know the comfort and strength which you give. We pray for all who are worried about loved ones who are far away. We give thanks for the technical means we now have to communicate with them. We pray for those who have a special difficulty with anxiety. May they not be forgotten amidst the virus crisis. May they too get the attention and the medical help they need. We uphold our National Health Service as it responds to this crisis. We pray for all those working in the NHS and in other caring roles who are helping and supporting others as best they can. We remember with gratitude the risks they are taking on our behalf and the personal sacrifices they are choosing to make. We remember those working behind the scenes, testing samples, confirming results. We uphold others trying to understand this virus better, working to create an effective remedy. We pray for our governments in Westminster and Holyrood as they work with the best medical advice to guide us on what action we must take to best protect ourselves and others and relieve the pressure on medical staff and facilities. We pray for those who have been laid off as their work disappears. We think of the financial hardship for individuals and businesses, the impact on the economy and pensions when austerity has already left its mark. We remember those who cannot visit loved ones in locked down care homes, hospices and hospitals, and the elderly and those who live on their own, whose social contacts have been severely curtailed. Help us to find ways of keeping in touch, of assuring them that they are not forgotten or ignored. May this crisis bring out the best in us, not the worst. Help us to live by faith, not by fear, to build bridges, not barriers, and to resist all who would speak ill of any other group. May we not forget our responsibility to one another, not least to the vulnerable and voiceless in our communities. May our congregations find new ways of living through this time. May we not forget our faith, but draw strength from it. So may our worship be heartfelt, our fellowship deepen, and our service increase. God of grace and mercy, hear our prayers at this time. Strengthen us by your Spirit, so that we may carry on our lives as best as we are able, looking out for others, showing love in action, being faithful in prayer, and bringing encouragement, hope, and peace trusting always in you, our rock and our redeemer. These prayers we bring to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Finally, a prayer for the start of Holy Week. Lord Jesus, in this sacred and solemn week, when we see again the depth and mystery of your redeeming love, help us to follow where you go, to stop where you stumble, to listen when you cry, to hurt as you suffer, to bow our heads in sorrow when you die, so that when you are raised to life again, we may share your endless joy. Amen. Now go in peace, following your Lord Jesus in his triumphal procession, wherever that takes you, and spreading the precious aroma of Christ in this needy world. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with, with each one of you, and with those whom you love, and with those whom you pray for, this day and for all eternity. Amen. <laughs>